Revelation chapter 1. Revelation chapter 1, verses 19 through 20. The notes are there for you on you version, so you can pull those up. Scripture references will also be on the screen uh, behind me, or actually on the wall because we don't have any screens. So I'll be more emphatic about that. Revelation 1, beginning with verse 19, John writes, Therefore, or Jesus, the resurrected Christ, the glorified Christ, speaks to John, and John writes down, the Lord says, Write, therefore, the things which you have seen, the things which are, and the things which will take place after these things. The things which are seen is everything that Christ, the glorified Christ, the resurrected Christ, who now sits at the right hand of the Father, is speaking to John in chapter 1. So, again, the things that are is everything that Christ has revealed in chapter 1. And then he goes on and he speaks about those things that you have seen, chapter 1, those things which are, which is the revelation to the seven churches in chapter 2 and 3, and the things will, will take place in the future which verse 19 speaks to, which is from chapter 4 through the end of Revelation. And then in verse 20, he says, As for the mystery of the seven stars which you saw in my right hand and the seven golden lampstands, the seven stars are the angels of the seven churches, the pastors, the messengers of the church, and the seven lampstands are the seven churches. We know at the end of the first century, As we have been looking, and if we dig into church history, we find at the end of the first century, Christianity was facing mounting persecution or opposition from the Roman Empire. From history, when Christianity was first birthed on the day of Pentecost, the Roman Empire looked at Christianity as a sect of Judaism. It came out of Judaism. And so... They left it alone as they did Judaism. Normally, if you didn't cause a revolt, the Roman Empire would let you keep your culture and things of that nature as long as you were obedient to the Roman Empire and you paid homage. And that's what we find in the beginning. But as the Jewish people began to persecute those that even Jesus said are the synagogue of Satan, they say that they are God followers, but they're not. Even as the Jewish nation began to persecute them, also the Roman Empire began to turn and persecute the church. And that's what we find taking place in the latter part of the first century. And the Apostle John, of whom wrote this letter to the church, he is now a prisoner on the island of Patmos, which was a penal colony. And he was there because of his faith in the one true God, which went against the Roman Empire. Empire embracing a plethora of gods. Chief among them, let us not forget, was the Caesar of Rome. And it was on this Isle of Patmos, this penal colony, that Christ, the glorified Christ, appears to John to send a message to the world. A message that is today what we know as the book of Revelation. And again, it's not Revelations because there is only one Revelation, and that is Christ. When we read the book of Revelation, it's not about end-time events. It is about the revelation of Jesus Christ, that he has won the victory. And through his victory, we have victory. And the book of Revelation reminds us that God is the writer of history. He's already written everything down. And no matter what man does, it goes according to the plan and the structure that God has already established. And so it just reminds us again of his authority And that as we continue to set our hopes and our trust in him, we will not be disappointed. This is a message of the past, Romans 1, of the present, our Revelation 1, the present, Revelation 2 and 3, and the future, Revelation 4 through Revelation 22. So tonight we are finishing our series on the seven churches of Revelation And as I have on each of the churches, as we've looked, we've always looked at the historical background because what we found in our study together is the historical background, it went along with what Christ pronounced to the church. When we look at the city of Laodicea, what we find is a wealthy city in Asia Minor, a wealthy city. In fact, the city lay on one of the greatest Asian trade routes. 
It was a crossroad of the trade routes which ensured its commercial prosperity. Laodicea, history tells us, was a leading banking center of the region. In fact, it is said that the textiles from Laodicea were coveted all over the known world at this time. And contributing to the general economic picture of Laodicea was the success of the hillside shepherds. And these individuals, they bred a certain type of sheep that were famous for their black and glossy soft wool. And this wool was the source of black cloaks and carpets, which made the city famous. Laodicea was also home of a medical school, and it manufactured calarum, which was famous as an eye salve. Again, remember all this history because it definitely connects in with the word that Christ has to the church. But it was famous for its medical school and for the eye salve that was sought by many in the region. And the affluence of this city was so great. You remember, we talked about the cities in this region like Philippi and others that were devastated by an earthquake in AD 17. And Laodicea was one of those cities. And we talked also about how that the Roman Empire, the Senate, sent aid to these cities because it devastated them. But Laodicea was so uh, rich in, in, in its influence that when the Senate said, hey, we'll give you means to be able to rebuild, Laodicea says, thanks, but no thanks, because we've got it covered. That's how economically sound and wealthy this city was. And as we come to verse 14, as Christ has for each of the churches, he always starts out by identifying himself to the church. So let's begin reading Revelation 3 and verse 14. The Lord says to the angel of the church in Laodicea, write, The Amen, the faithful and true witness, the origin of the creation of God, says this. Father, we just pray, open our hearts to receive your word. That, Lord, we may be living epistles of your truth. Lord, we ask and we pray it in Jesus' holy name. Amen. Christ has already affirmed himself as the Lord of the lampstands. And we know that the lampstands represented the church, specifically the seven churches in Asia that speak to the entirety of the body of Christ. He is the one who walks among the lamp stands and holds the seven stars in his hands that represents the pastors or the leaders of these churches. And he identifies himself to the church at Laodicea in three ways that we've just read of here in verse 14. In fact, the first way is he says, I am the Amen. The Amen. Now, the normal Hebrew adverb that is rendered for us as Amen by the Greek, it means the acknowledgement of that which is sure or valid. The acknowledgement of that which is sure or valid. The root idea of this word is firmness. It's certainty. It's the assurance of our faith. So the reference points to the fact that Christ is the affirmation of God, of who God is in representation to his creation. As the amen... He, Christ, guarantees the truth of God's promises. But not only is he the amen, the guarantee of the truth of God's promises, the affirmation of God to his creation, Christ also presents himself as the faithful and the true witness. Now we understand witnesses, and maybe it would take our minds to our court system today, that they, they call for witnesses to affirm a stance or either to see that it's a lie. And some witnesses may tell the truth, but they prove unreliable because they do not faithfully appear to testify. It doesn't matter if you were going to tell the truth. If you don't show up to tell it, it doesn't help, does it? And not only that, but others might be faithful to appear, but they are false witnesses and they mislead. But Christ, 
is both the faithful and the true witness. He is faithful and he is faithful to the truth of who God is. He will always be faithful to give testimony of who the Lord is. And he will perpetually speak what is truth because that is his nature. He is the amen. He is faithful and true witness. And then finally he re- reveals himself to the church as the origin of the creation of God. Now, all these are important. Christ, as the Son of God, was not created. Now, I know that may blow some individual's mind that when we try to think and sit there and think, okay, well, when did God come into existence? He's always existed. No one created him. And I know in our human minds that if we try to think about that, it's almost trying to to think about the Trinity. Is it just, it's beyond our concept. We trust in the Lord and what he says. Christ as God, the Son, was not created. He always was, is, and will be. And he is, as the origin of the creation of God, he is the mediator. The mediator in God's creation. He is God's agent in creation. In fact, John said it this way in his gospel account, the last of the four accounts given in John 1, 3, he says, all things came into being through him, through Christ. And apart from him, not even one thing came into being that has come into being. Now, we know that all the other gospel accounts, what we would call the synoptic gospels, which is Matthew, Mark, and Luke, the synoptic gospels, they all start with the birth of Christ. The birth of Christ. And what John does, being that those gospels, the synoptic gospels, have already been written, what he does, he says, I am writing to stir you to believe in the Son of the living God. We find that at the end of John. But where he starts is in the very beginning. In the very beginning. And he speaks to the eternal nature of Christ because he is God. And as we've read here in verse 3, all things came into being through Christ. And apart from Christ, not even one thing came into being that has come into being. Before there was anything, there was God, Christ. So, verse 14, Christ declares himself as the affirmation of God, the amen, the faithful and the true witness, the one who rules permanently over God's creation. He is, in the final analysis, if you will, the one who alone positionally is able to know and to speak the truth. And having identified himself, the Lord now identifies the issues, the problems within the church in Laodicea, affirming once again that he is the one who knows our deeds. Verse 15, Christ says, I know your deeds, that you are neither hot nor cold, or cold nor hot. I wish that you were cold or hot. So because you are lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, I will vomit, spew you out of my mouth. Now, history definitely plays a part here. Because if we look back and dig into the history of this city, what we'll find is that while Laodicea was blessed with prosperity, and while it was a city that was blessed with prestige, the water supply was an issue. It was a problem. In fact, it didn't have its own supply of water, and so water had to be piped in, which wasn't unusual. There were other cities around Laodicea that had to have water piped in. In fact, if we look at just archaeology today, what we find is that when they have dug in the area of Laodicea, that they have found the remains of an ancient aqueduct. And what they discovered in this ancient aqueduct is pipes. And inside those pipes were discovered large mineral deposits that had accumulated over time as the water passed through. And as they've tested this and as they've looked at it and even looked at Laodicea's history, what this indicated is that the water that arrived from its source was, that was used in Laodicea was mineral-laden 
And so therefore, it was nauseating to the taste. In fact, Laodicea was known for its nauseating water. Anybody ever tasted water that was nauseating? Okay, so, so you can identify with that. Well, that was kind of the thing for this city is it had nauseating water. It became well known for its tepid and revolting water, which almost everyone found repulsive. And Christ says, and it helped them to identify because they lived here, Christ says to the church in Laodicea that like your own water supply, you are lukewarm, you're not cold, you're not hot, and you're disgusting to my taste. Now there are pages upon pages that are written discussing what Jesus meant regarding cold or hot. Now, have you ever thought about this? The word hot, I mean, we can grasp that, right? That's a good word. If we're on fire for the Lord, of which we say many times, then the word hot really kind of leads to that, doesn't it? But, But how can we equate that Jesus says, I would either desire you to be hot on fire or to be cold? Do we find anywhere else in Scripture that the Lord would say, I wish you were cold? And there's been countless pages, like I said, with theologians writing, what did Jesus mean by the word cold? What do you mean by referring to cold? Well, if we dig into the history, and you guys possibly already know this, so I just want to refresh it. If we look again at the region. What we find in keeping in the historical context of the water issues in Laodicea, what we find is that just a little south of them, if I'm not mistaken, it was south, was the city of Colossae, of which Paul wrote Colossians to the church in Colossae. And Colossae was known for their cool, refreshing water because the water supply that they received was from the mountain peaks that had snow, so when the snow would melt, it was cool. How many of you like when you go and you want some water, you like ice water? I mean, I like ice water. It's refreshing. Well, Colossae was known for their quote-unquote, not like we have it today, but ice water, if you will. It was cool. It was cold. It was refreshing. And another neighboring town is Heropolis. And Heropolis was known not for their cold, refreshing water, but Heropolis was known for their hot, refreshing springs. I don't know if anybody likes to, to get into hot tubs or if you like to go to some places like Hot Spring, Arkansas, that has hot springs that you can, give in, you can get in. Well, from my understanding with the minerals and different things in that is it actually helps your joints. <laughs> it, it, there's purpose. So, Individuals found pleasure in the hot springs of Heropolis, and they also found pleasure in the cold, refreshing water of Colossae. And so since we find in the historical context, I don't think it would be a reach for us. Many theologians agree in this flow of thought that what Jesus is referring to here is that he is telling them that he wished that they were either a fresh, life-giving drink of cold water or else they were a healing hot mineral bath. Both brought about satisfaction or brought about ministering to a need. Fresh, life-giving drink of cold water or either the healing of a hot mineral bath. But because they were neither, they weren't refreshing and life-giving nor healing They were simply, Jesus says, disgusting to the taste. And he says, I'm going to spew you, spit you out of my mouth. And that's not even the depth of their issue. It wasn't the depth. The depth of their issue wasn't that they were lukewarm. They were neither cold. They were neither hot. The depth of their issue wasn't just in their indifference. It was in their ignorance of their spiritual condition. Because look at verse 17. Verse 17, Jesus says, because you say, I am rich and have become wealthy and have no need of anything 
and you do not know that you are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. The depth of their issue wasn't just indifference. The depth of their issue is they didn't realize their spiritual condition, that they were neither cold nor hot, but they were lukewarm. And Jesus calls them wretched. And and the word wretched, it describes life when everything one owns has been destroyed or plundered by war. We dig into that word wretched. We find it describes life when everything that an individual owns has been destroyed or plundered by war. And here it refers to the Laodiceans' spiritual destitution before God. He says, you're poor. Poor. Now just think about this. You're living in a wealthy city, and possibly it wouldn't be a stretch for us to think that these Christians were well off. And poor as a description of their lives may have been surprising to the congregation because of their affluency in their material means. And the word The word poor here that is used by John, that the Lord stirred within his heart, it doesn't mean just simple poverty. No, this word for poor, it goes much deeper than that. It talks about grinding poverty, the depths of poverty and need. And like this wealthy city, its church had abundance, but still was wallowing, Jesus says, in spiritual squalor, if you will, before the gaze of the Lord. And it seems that the church's outward prosperity had made them blind to their deep spiritual need. And I think something else that we can take from verse 17 is just because we have material well-being, it doesn't necessarily mean that we're walking in obedience with God. That's not where we put our faith and our faith in him is in what's going on on the outside. We put our faith and our faith in him in what's going on on the inside. Are we fully and completely surrendered to him and find full satisfaction in him? Now, I'm not saying God doesn't bless because we know God does bless. And I'm not saying that he does not give to us when we are faithful to him because, as the old saying goes, you can never outgive God, right? I mean, we have testimony among testimony here, do we not? That when we're faithful to the Lord and we give sacrificially, not so we can get back, but because we want to invest in the kingdom, what does God do? He opens the windows of heaven and he does pour out a blessing. So that is all true, but what I'm saying is this, and it it goes, I firmly do believe, against the whole prosperity message. You do this, you do this, you do this, God's going to prosper. And the, the issue with the prosperity message is we're so concerned with what's on the outside instead of what's on the inside. And here Jesus says, you're wretched, you're poor. And notice the other descriptors that that he uses in verse 17. You're miserable. You're blind. You're naked. You're naked. And then he goes on and, and, and he speaks to the remedy. Verse 18 and 19. Jesus says, I advise you. I advise you to buy from me gold refined by fire. So that you may become rich and white garments so that you may clothe yourself and the shame of your nakedness will not be revealed and I salve to apply to your eyes so that you may see. And even though the state of this church was on the verge of disaster, Jesus says all is not lost. And he gives a loving rebuke to call the church back, to call him back to himself. Because notice what he says in verse 17, those whom I love, I rebuke and I discipline. Therefore, be zealous and repent. Be zealous and repent. Christ's nature is 
the faithful and true witness as he described himself, it meant that he would not hold back when it came to indictments of their spiritual condition. But also, it, he doesn't set aside his love and his grace. He is the faithful and true witness, but he is also the one who in love and grace came so that we could have life. And aren't you thankful that when we mess up the first time or the second time or the third time that he doesn't kick us to the curb? I'm done with you. Like the woman we always make kind of fun when we say the joke about the guy that continues to come up, revival after revival after revival, Lord, forgive me, Lord, forgive me. And you guys all y'all know the punchline, Lord, don't feel him because he leaks. Whatever you do, it's just going to go right out. But I'm thankful for God's mercy. I'm thankful for his grace, and I'm thankful for his love. It wasn't too late. They hadn't reached the point of no return to the Lord. And first, Christ tells them to buy from him. Buy from him. Now notice, again, all the history of this city, of their community and everything, the Lord addresses it. It coincides with how he deals with them spiritually. It's not a stretch for us to believe because they live in this city that they weren't affluent. And they didn't have the means to go out and buy. And he says to them, buy from me. Buy from me what? Gold refined in the fire that can make you truly rich. Buy from me, Christ says, white garments to clothe your nakedness. Buy from me eye salve. So that your eyes could be healed to see again in a city that where it was a banking center in the day. And not only that, they were very prosperous. People in the church probably had means. But he says, don't find your means there. Find your means in me. The city was also very famous for the eye salve that they used to sell. That people would come from all over to purchase. And the Lord says, buy from me eye salve so that you're seeing, your spiritual eyes can be healed and you can see again. In essence, Christ was telling them to stop trusting in themselves and turn completely to him. In place of dependence on worldly wealth that bought that brought about spiritual poverty because that's where they were, Christ offered true spiritual riches. And in place of relying on their outer appearance that left them spiritually naked, Christ offered to clothe them in his own righteousness, which we know the white garments in other places in Scripture, even here in Revelation, speaks to that. Clean, spotless. And instead of a physical salve to heal To heal blurred vision, Jesus offered them spiritual eye salve to cure the spiritual cataracts, if you will, of their character. But then notice also, Christ reassured them. He reassured them of his love. Though he severely rebuked them, he added words of love. Those whom I love, I rebuke. And discipline. Those whom I love, that's Jesus' word to his people. Those whom I love, I rebuke and discipline. Proverbs 3.12 speaks to this. For whom the Lord loves, he corrects, just as a father the son in whom he delights. In fact, the writer of Hebrews gives more detail to this subject of God's loving discipline. In Hebrews 12, verses 7 through 11, and I want to read it in the New Living Translation. It says, as you endure this divine discipline, remember that God is treating you as his own children. Who ever heard of a child who is never disciplined by his father? Verse 8, if God doesn't discipline you as he does all of his children, it means that you are illegitimate and are not really his children at all. Since we respected our earthly fathers who disciplined us, shouldn't we submit even more to the discipline of the Father of our spirits and live forever? For our earthly fathers disciplined us for a few years, doing the best they knew how. But God's discipline is always good for us so that we might share in his holiness. No discipline is enjoyable while it is happening. Why? Because it's painful. But afterwards... 
after the discipline, after we've submitted to the discipline, I never once turned around and thanked my daddy when he was whooping me. Anybody ever do that? Thank you, daddy. I needed that. I never did that after I got through crying. (laughs) But no discipline is enjoyable, verse 11 in the New Living says. While it is happening, it's painful. But afterwards, there will be a peaceful harvest of right living for those who are trained in this way. If we yield and if we give in to the Lord's loving discipline. The conviction of God's Spirit is His love reaching out to us. And when we yield to that conviction, when I yield, when you yield, when a sinner yields to that conviction, we're able to experience God's love and His restoration. Because the Lord loved them, He loved them, He rebuked them. And he sought to give them discipline training as he would give to all of his children. Because he was giving them an opportunity to make things right. Isn't that God's love? He was giving them. He brought about the reality of their wrong. You know, have you ever prayed this prayer? In fact, I was reminded of this at, at Men's Encounter last week. Wasn't that last week? Yes, last week. Sorry. I was reminded of this, that even by David Strahan was talking about this. And I've asked the Lord, God, show me my wrong. Have you ever prayed that? I pray that continuously. Lord, help me to learn how to keep this vessel. And this is from 1 Thessalonians. Help me to learn how to keep this vessel in sanctification and honor and not in the lust of the flesh. In other words, show me my wrong. And I've prayed that, and you know, The Lord convicts and he will show us. But we must never forget that is his love reaching down to us. In order to receive that love, we've got to respond to it. Lord, forgive me. God, forgive me. His love doesn't just excuse our sin and say, you're okay. You're okay. Just keep going. No. No, his love, it transforms us by yielding to his correction. And that's what the Lord was doing. The Laodiceans were steeped in self-reliance. Do we not read that in these verses? They were self-reliant. The Lord says, you think you're okay. You've got everything you need. We don't need anything. And God says, no, in reality, spiritually, you are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, naked. They were steeped in self-reliance. They shamelessly trusted in themselves, in their riches, and in their own strength. Yet out of a fatherly love for his children, Christ presented a clear solution. He says, be zealous and repent. Be zealous and repent. And this verse is quoted so much. Verse 20. Jesus says, behold, I stand at the door and knock. Now let's keep it in its context. I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come to him and will dine with him and he with me. You know, dining, that whole reference there, when we talk about the culture of the day, it refers to the main meal of the day in that culture. And it was a significant occasion for having intimate fellowship with family and with the closest friends. That's what Jesus is alluding to. Having intimate fellowship. Intimate fellowship. And when we read that verse, the question to be answered is always the relationship of Christ to his local church, to his body. Is he on the inside embraced, loved, honored, enthroned, and followed, or is he on the outside knocking and calling for entrance to the entity that bears his own name? Keeping in the context of the scripture here, and yes, I don't think we would be stretching it that we could apply it individually, because we are to bear his name as well. Is he on the inside, embraced, loved, honored, enthroned, and followed? Or is he on the outside knocking and calling for entrance to that which bears his name? And then he finishes in verse 21 and 22. He says, the one who overcomes. 
In other words, the one who hears my word, receives it, and responds by faith, and walks faithfully with me, the one who overcomes, I will grant them to sit with me on my throne, as I also overcame and sat with my Father on his throne. The promise to the overcomers concerns the sharing in Christ's future reign, that we will reign with him in his exalted position because we will see him as he is and we'll become like him in his nature. We won't become God, but we will become like him in the perfect nature that he created us in in the very beginning, right? Let us create man, the Godhead said in Genesis, how? In our image. We will bear his perfect image again. Perfect image again. And that's what Christ is referring to. And then he finishes as he has in all other of words to the church. The one who has an ear, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Each of the seven, as we close and Kip comes, each of the seven challenges the Lord has given an aspect of what Holy Spirit keeps on saying to the body of Christ, corporately as well as individually. And we find Holy Spirit wants all, all churches, the body of Christ as a whole and individually of all ages to hear the message. He wants all of us individually to hear the message, corporately, individually to hear not just as something that was once upon a time when individuals won a victory, but that we as overcomers would walk in victory. The promises are to those who keep on overcoming, to those who keep on winning victories in Christ because we are fully and we're completely dependent upon Him in our lives. As overcomers, winners, victors, we know we will have problems. We'll have battles. We'll have difficulties. And, and even times that we feel defeat. But we have to remember that Christ's victory is the secret of our victory. And we have to keep our faith in him. First John 5, 5 says, Who is the one who overcomes the world but the one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God? And that word believe, it doesn't just speak to something that we have in our head. A creed that's that we know, but it, it speaks to the way that we live our lives and the way that we respond to who He is. As we move on from this study, starting next Wednesday, as I've been praying, just asking the Lord to just lead me and what to bring to you, we're going to begin a study in the fruit of the Spirit, and then it's going to move us into the gift of Holy Spirit. And what we find in Galatians with the fruit of the Spirit and what we find in Romans chapter 12 and 1 Corinthians 12, 1 Corinthians 14, as well as in Ephesians chapter 4. And this goes along with what we're going to end the service with tonight. As we find the Lord talking about the fruit, the character of Christ. And what we find is the giftings that God has given to enable us as his children to do what he's called us to do. Encouraging one another and strengthening one another and coming alongside of one another and glorifying his name. But also reaching into the world and carry the great commission, the love of Christ. All of that, the character, the gifts, and as well as the fruit, they're fully dependent upon him. Upon Holy Spirit. I frustrate God's grace when I try to become more loving. I try to become more joyful. I try to become more patient, more kind, more good. If I'm trying, I'm going to fail. If you're trying, let me just go ahead and tell you, you're going to fail. The whole deal is we are dependent upon him to do in us by his grace what we can't do for ourselves. And that comes by being surrendered and submitted to him and staying before him so we can hear what the Spirit is saying. Are we fully dependent? Full dependence is what leads us and keeps us in a life of overcoming. 
The church in Laodicea was not dependent upon the Lord. That was their biggest issue. And because they weren't dependent, they didn't see their issue. Are we fully dependent? And is that shown by how we approach each and every day? Lord, I can't do this without you. And you haven't called me to. Lord, lead me, direct me, enable me. Father, Lord, as we come to this time now, Lord, I pray, speak to our hearts. In fact, Lord, you have already been speaking through your word. And Lord, even as we end this journey together, Lord, in this series on the seven churches, that, Lord, that you spoke to, that transcends time, it speaks to us. God, as we come to the church of Laodicea, we find that they were, they were fully dependent on, on their resources. They were fully dependent on their means physically. And they did not realize that they were wretched, that they were poor, that they were miserable, that they were naked, and that they were blind. Because they weren't dependent upon you. Lord, we cannot do the things you have called us to do, and we cannot be who you've called us to be in your son unless we are fully surrendered and dependent. Can we stand tonight? Can we just pray just a prayer of sacrifice once again? Can we ask the Lord to just reveal to us, are there areas in my life that I'm not dependent upon you? Maybe there's, there's frustration in our spiritual lives because we're not fully dependent. And the Lord in his loving hand will come and will show if we will look to him and open our lives. Can we do that right now? Can we just ask him, Lord, is there any area in my life? Lord, am I, am I fully and completely dependent upon you? Lord, if there's any place in my life, any area, Lord, I pray, open my eyes. Enable me to see, oh God, because I know I can't do this. I can't be a better person. I can't be like Christ. I can't be more loving. I can't be more faithful. I cannot cause the fruit of Holy Spirit to grow within me. It comes from being fully connected to the vine because you have spoken to us in John 15. Apart from me, you can do nothing. But remaining in me, you will be fruitful. You will be useful for the kingdom. Oh, Lord God, touch our hearts. Are we fruitful? Are we useful for the kingdom? Are we fruitful? Are we useful for the kingdom? Holy Spirit, lead us. Come on, just pray right there. Don't, don't just listen to me. I know it's been a long day. It's, it's, it's been a long day. But can we just take just a few moments and just pray, Lord?